Hi, everyone. Welcome to uh, our joint our joint webinar series, our joint programming of the Earth Day Everyday Earth Day Everyday programming and our Marine Extension Program seminar series. I am Michelle Backus, and I'm with Rutgers Cooperative Extension. I'm a county agent with Middlesex and Union County and associate professor at Rutgers University. Thanks for being with us this evening and, and coming to us wherever you are in this beautiful evening. Uh, so we are starting up, this is the first of our spring webinar series. And the theme for, for those of you who have been with us be, before, you know, the last couple of times that we've done this, we've kind of been doing them with, with themes. Last fall was weathering the storm where we've, it was, uh, um, we were celebrating the 10th anniversary or acknowledging the, the 10th anniversary of Hurricane Sandy. Uh, so this time around, we are looking at all the small things with big environmental impacts. And we're starting this off with uh, looking at beech leaf disease. Uh, so as I said, uh, we are with Rutgers Cooperative Extension. Rutgers Cooperative Extension is the outreach arm of Rutgers University. Uh, we are, Rutgers Cooperative Extension is a partnership between the counties that we serve and the university and every county in the state has a Rutgers Cooperative Extension office. And what we do is we provide science-based information to the public to make their lives better, whether or not you're a resident or you're part of industry, um, we are there to 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 help improve the lives of, of New Jersey residents. Um, so if we could, if you could progress to the next slide, Jean. A couple of things. One is that please this evening, if you could put your questions, the chat, you'll see the chat is disabled. Um, but if you could put your questions in the QA, in the QA. Um, we'll be able to answer your questions or lay our and uh, your questions to Jean that way. I also am required to tell you that this project is um, uh, part of, of the University um, Human Subjects Protection. Uh, we need your cons consent to take part in what the univer university considers to be research. So it's not that we're going to be poking and prodding you with needles, but instead, uh, there's going to be a survey at the end of this uh, session. So if you could please take part in that survey, that would be really great. And then the, at the beginning of the survey, you'll just indicate that um, you do or you don't take uh, consent to be part of the, the research study. Okay, so next slide. Also, I'm required to let you know that Rector's Cooperative Extension is an equal opportunity program provider and employer. And uh, um, um, we follow federal law and U.S. Department of Agriculture civil rights regulations and policies. And if you have any issues or concerns related to discrimination, you can uh, use that number there to relay any concerns that you may have. Okay, so next slide. Okay, so this evening we have with us our newest member of our department, our Ag and Natural Resources Department, uh, Jean Epifan. Uh, Jean holds a master's in ecology and evolution from Rutgers and also a bachelor's in forestry from University of Vermont. She is a New Jersey licensed tree expert and a 2018 ISA certified arborist. And in her position, she focuses on commercial nursery production and sustainable landscape management. She also works with the Rutgers Master Gardener Program and Environmental Steward Program, two of our extension volunteer programs. And today she is going to be talking to us about beech leaf disease and all the tiny pests with big potential impacts. Thank you, Jean. I'll turn it over to you. Thank you so much, Michelle. Uh, what a nice uh, introduction. So as she said, I'm a Rutgers Extension agent and I am based in the Morris County office. And today I'll be sharing with you a program on beech leaf disease, which is caused by a teeny tiny invasive pest. And what it brings with it are big potential impacts to our landscape. I will review how to identify beech leaf disease, what impacts we expect in the landscape and steps towards mitigation. 
But first, it is important to thoroughly review the functional and ecological roles of beech in New Jersey as they are threatened by BLD, beech leaf disease. Just a note, there is a different disease called beech bark disease that was introduced over a hundred years ago is very well studied. It's a completely different disease and not the focus of this program. So beech belong to the genus Fagus. We have both native and non-native species here in New Jersey. The native species is American beech, Fagus grandifolia which is a common tree in most forest types in New Jersey. The map here shows forests in green. The main exotic beach in New Jersey is European beach, Fagus sylvatica, which has been commonly planted in suburbs and developed environments. This is displayed in pink on the map, but this is where both the native and the non-native beach exist together. European beach has been widely cultivated and has many varieties in the developed landscape. They come weeping, twisted shaped with purple leaves, some multicolored, their fastigiate forms and so on, but they all stem from the original straight species from Europe. We'll be focusing more on American beech today as there are many more in New Jersey than European beech, but both are highly susceptible to beech leaf disease and will both be greatly impacted. And just a note on plant ID, the one main difference between the European and the American beech are in the leaves. European beech has a rounder shape with a wavy leaf margin, as you can see on the right. While American beech, the leaf is longer, has a pointier tip and a toothed margin. American beech's native range is throughout most of Eastern United States. In New Jersey, it is found in each of the five physiographic provinces. And it's throughout the oak hickory forests and hardwood forests listed here. In the Northern portion of the state, beech occurs in the dry mesic oak or oak hickory forests, as well as Northern hardwood forests. In the Southern half of the state, Beech is a component of the coastal plain hardwood forests, which include also both hickory and oak. Beech is common to find in most of the mature forests throughout the state, except for this one area that is dominated by pitch pine forests. Beech rarely are seen in, in this forest type. So in general, beech, have a very wide range. They're found in uplands, mountain slopes, as well as bottomlands, stream banks, and seeps. And importantly, beech are what we call climax associated. It is a dominant tree of the later succession forest types, shown here on the right of this forest succession diagram. In the northern hardwood forests, beech can be found with climax cohorts like sugar maple and hemlock. While in oak hickory forests in New Jersey, beech often grow alongside the oldest oaks of the forest. Another typical trait of climax species, including beech, is that they are very shade tolerant and create deep shade as well. And to be clear, this image shows primary forest succession. But in New Jersey, we mostly have secondary succession as a result of mass deforestation. So if we combine these two diagrams, it better illustrates forest succession in New Jersey, where mature oak hickory forests progress or can progress to a more beech dominant climax forest or northern hardwood forest. Beech is very important for wildlife. Back when I was in forestry school 20 years ago, we were taught that beech nuts for animals were like candy for kids. They go crazy for them. That's why it isn't easy to find beech nuts on the ground. You basically just find uh, the, 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 the little hairy shells left over on the floor at the end of the fall. Well, the, for, the, flo the forest floor, I mean. And beech nuts are one of the most sought after foods. They're even labeled as a superfood for wildlife, especially bears. 
They're very rich in protein and fats, which are vital for surviving through the winter. The amount of protein in beech nuts is around double the amount found in acorns. The loss of this food source would be devastating for many populations of bears, porcupine, fox, chipmunks, and other rodents, and many species of birds in New Jersey. Buds are also eaten by many birds. Notably, the purple finch has been historically documented as one of the few beech leaf bud eaters, but now we know many more species of birds feed on beech buds in fall and winter. More about this on some later slides. This is a very important note. Beech also makes sap, which some folks even tap for syrup. But the original beech sap tappers are yellow-bellied sap suckers that famously make their sap access holes in horizontal lines on the main trunks. You may have seen this on beech or other species of trees. And of course, the leaves and twigs are browsed by our overabundant white-tailed deer. However, they're not their favorite browse. Maples and oaks do get eaten first. Beech provide valuable habitat for many species of insects. Beech host over a hundred species of butterfly and moth caterpillars. Examples are the early hair streak and white streak prominent. Beech also host wood boring beetles and leaf hoppers. Caterpillars, beetles, and leaf hoppers are all important foundational parts of our food web. For example, caterpillars are vital to the growth and health of newly hatched birds also known as nestlings. Caterpillars are the most nutritious food source available for nestlings, as Doug Tallamy has taught us, and our native birds have evolved to raise their young on caterpillars. And quite a sight on forest beach in summer you might catch are these native woolly beach aphids. They're also called beach blight aphids. The infestation looked like a white fungal growth, but it moves. I actually wanted to put a video in here, but it really wasn't working because I did capture that in the forest. And in any case, these are a collection of aphids and they're fluffy wool and they move around. Their excrement or honeydew produce that they produce attract other insects like ants and wasps and the harvester butterfly that feed on the honeydew. And then the woolly leftovers actually pile up with the honeydew and they get covered in a sooty mold that's actually called the beach aphid poop eater. Imagine that. <laughs> you may see this in the forest and think it's a disease where you see this black sooty mold all over. Well, it's just a decomposer of the honeydew and really doesn't do the forest any harm. But some studies have shown that sooty molds actually help remove pollutants from the air. Another common, uh, a couple other common bugs that live on beach include the beach rolling aphid, the beach leaf ro rolling aphid, excuse me, and areophyte mites. Both are native, cause no real harm to beach. They have their own insect, spider, and centipede predators, and are parts of the forest food web. Each of these species require beech as their host. American beech has another species specific relationship with a root parasite, beech drops or Epiphagus virginiana. Because of this, beech drops are only found under beech. This parasitic plant doesn't harm the beech, but it taps its root system for all its water and nutrition needs. Beach drops cannot survive on their own, and they lack chlorophyll. That's why they aren't green, and they're really hard to spot. They look like a cluster of sticks. You can see, I circled, you can barely see maybe, the beach drops or the, the sticks inside those red circles on the right. And that little circle actually is circling a bumblebee, which is better portrayed in that central photo. Beach drops provide floral resources for bumblebees as well as ants. And ants even collect their pollen and nectar and cross-pollinate the open flowers and disperse the seeds. Other flowers on beech drops remain closed for self-pollination. American beech form dense colonies. The primary stem of a, of a mature beech will eventually grow many clonal saplings from its root system creating 
this dense grove effect. You can see this, the, the mother tree in the center just past that little piece of yellow flagging tape and the rest are its saplings. This growth habit really is a fantastic location for nesting and shelter. The wood thrush in particular are known for utilizing dense beech sapling stands. This is a great way for beech also to occupy territory. Here's another example of a dense clonal cluster of young beech saplings among a few mother trees. This growth habit really makes you wonder how some, old, some of our beech trees, how old they really are. And perhaps how, it makes you wonder how large some of these organisms really are. Maybe it's just one tree with hundreds of saplings occupying even an acre. That's pretty amazing, maybe even larger. But it's important to note that this typical beach vegetative form includes every vertical stratum from ground to mid-story to canopy, and all of those leaves intercept rainwater, which helps prevent erosion. Oh, I think I skipped a slide. No? Oh, I'm actually missing one. That... Well, um, another way that beech provides shelter more than other deciduous trees is through marquesans. You can often find beech as well as oaks holding onto their leaves. They hold onto their leaves all winter long and it's a great way for little animals like in the ground layer around saplings to have some shelter from the cold or predators. And in, up in a, some tree canopies, if they're still holding their leaves, that provides shelter for um, multiple different species. But here you may see that I circled, I caught a glimpse of a great horned owl sitting in, in the winter up in a beech tree with its marquescent leaves. And on the subject of leaf litter, leaf litter of beech is important habitat for the health of forest and the maintenance of forest soil quality. Beech leaves have high lignin content, which slows their rate of decomposition and results in a thick leaf litter layer, which accumulates under beech. This is beneficial for regulating moisture, reducing soil erosion. It actually prevents and or slows invasive plant infiltration. Uh, it also combats invasive worms as the beech litter is harder for them to process in comparison to other species of trees like maple and tulip and ash. And the leaf litter helps to maintain native soil quality, acidic pH and a thick duff layer. Because of this, beech are found in high quality forest soils, but they also maintain this high quality of the forest soils. Importantly, beech leaf litter provides habitat, larval hosting, shelter, and camouflages forest animals. As you can see, they're not so easy to spot without the, the red circles around them. But many insects and small mammals need the leaf litter in place for overwintering. And as we mentioned, the clonal growth form is beneficial for wildlife, but it's also beneficial for us. The many clonal sprouts and fastidious root systems help to hold slopes and banks on stream sides and rivers. This is an important ecosystem service for protecting watersheds and water quality. And speaking of streams, let's mention class one streams. These are shown in purple on the map. Beach is a common and often dominant tree of riparian gallery forests that shade inland class one streams, but not so much the ones along the coast. Beach also are a common tree of mountain seeps and swamps that feed into class one streams. Therefore, beech contribute greatly to maintaining class one status, which include 
high water quality, aesthetic value, ecological value, habitat for at-risk species, and especially cold water fisheries. Beach provides such, such dense and deep shade as they stretch out over stream sides like in this photo, which helps very much to keep these class one trout streams cool in hot summer months. And if a trout stream's temperatures are elevated for too long, they can no longer provide the quality habitat for trout and the indigenous aquatic ecosystem that they require. And furthermore, this shade helps to protect our water supplies by limiting evaporation. The photo on the right is of a class one stream. This is a tributary of the Passaic River. It is surrounded and shaded by a beech forest. This left picture shows a patch of smag sphagnum moss with trout lily leaves at the feet of beach in a mountain seep. These are just a couple of photographic examples of the ecological community's beach support. Another ecosystem service that beach provide is climate control. The deep shade in beach dominant forest helps to keep our land cooler in summer, cooler than it would be without beach. And here's just another photo of a shady beach forest in northern New Jersey. This one is in Morris County. Here are a couple shots of beach in southern forests in Gloucester County, courtesy of my friend Joe Arsenault. And I just want to recap that we reviewed abundant ecological services that beach provide in New Jersey. And now, unfortunately, these forests and all that they support are at risk because of a microscopic pest that causes beech leaf disease. So this is what we know so far about beech leaf disease. BLD is caused by an invasive nematode. It's microscopic, as you can see. Liddy lentius crenate subspecies mechanii. This subspecies is from the original Liddy Lentius cretene that lives on Japanese beech buds and leaves. But the main assumption is that the subspecies is also exotic and from Asia. Studies are ongoing to determine the exact origin. Leaf buds are the infection court for this inv invasive nematode. The roots, twigs, and wood have not been shown to carry the nematode. The assumption is that nematodes are limited to the leaf buds and the leaves. Research is ongoing to determine more conclusive facts about this invasive pest. When the infected leaf bud unfurls in spring, the damage is already done. BLD is recognized by thickened tissue between the parallel veins that I'm about to show you on the next slide. But importantly, Experts first suspected that one bird species was the long distance vector. They put the blame on purple finch as it was one of the only birds that was historically noted to eat beech buds and its range overlapped with the current infection range. However, it has been brought to light that many more species of birds eat beech buds and several bird species have been found to be carrying the BLD causing nematode. Therefore, the primary conclusion is that the long distance vectors are like, are the likely, um, excuse me, the long distance vectors are likely several species of beach buds that eat beach and they, I'm sorry, that, that didn't come out, right? Let me let me repeat that. Therefore, the primary conclusion is that the long distance vectors are likely several species of birds that eat beech buds, and nothing has been definitely stated regarding a full species list of vectors. We're hoping to receive this soon, and studies are ongoing. Furthermore, no conclusions have been drawn regarding close proximity infection but some suspect arthropods can spread the nematode into new parts of the canopy or nearby beech trees. Again, though, there are no concrete findings to date. 
And here are our BLD infective leaves I promised you. These were just unfurled. This photo was taken in May and they show the distinct and unmistakable banding between the uninfected parts of the leaf. The best way to observe this striping is to hold the leaf up to a light source, like the sky, where you can see the opaqueness of the infected areas in comparison to the translucent, uninfected parts of the leaf. Leaves that are badly infected end up curling up, desiccating and falling off. This is how the nematode starves the tree of nutrients. With the loss of leaves, it inhibits the tree's ability to photosynthesize. The trees basically starve to death. So, BLD was first found in 2012 in Ohio. It has since spread eastward and up to Maine and down to Virginia. In New Jersey, it's spread across the northern half, and it, is, it has not yet been reported further south than Monmouth County. We're waiting to see if people spot it this year. Unfortunately, no, we do know that BLD is deadly to our American beach and planted European beach. Mature beech are anticipated to die after six to 10 years of infection, and saplings can die in about two years. Even worse, there's no treatment yet labeled that can successfully kills the BLD causing nematodes. Researchers are making rapid advancements in nematicidal products with trials. They're ongoing though, and we hope soon there'll be a product available. But even if there is, it would likely be for arboricultural or single tree applications, which are not very helpful to beach forests, even though they may help preserve beach in suburban and urban areas. A biocontrol, if discovered, would be many years out from now, but this would be a great advancement and some hope for our forests. We'll review in a few slides some steps we can take to mitigate this impending beach crisis. But first, let's quickly review what exactly is at risk. The many ecosystem services are at risk that I outlined earlier. But here's a short run through. So the forests and developed lands in New Jersey will be seeing losses of tree canopies and shade. We will be losing the cooling benefits created by beach and beach forests. This will increase urban heat islands and suburbs and urban areas where there are beach and will change the temperature and assemblages of many New Jersey forests. We will lose beaches deep shade in the climax forest in New Jersey, and they may even cease to exist in time. We have already begun losing other climax cohorts like hemlock from an invasive insects and predictably soon sugar maple due to climate change. The loss of the beach colony strongholds in these forests will be devastating and may, might even be the end of the Northern hardwood climax forest in New Jersey. The opening canopies will allow faster infiltration of invasive plants that take over our understories. And we will discuss this a little bit further in, in some slides coming up. And as beach currently holds slopes, stream banks have multiple levels of vertical strata, intercept rain and shade wetlands, the losses of beach will harm our watershed's functions. BLD impacts will inhibit water infiltration, rain interception, and the protection from erosion and water reserve evaporation. And for class one streams, which many of which are shaded by beach, we will see canopies opening, increased temperatures and reduced water holding capacity, which will impact aquatic ecosystem health. For example, the cool waters that trout require may no longer stay cool enough to support the natural trout populations. With BLD advancing in beach forests, it will also harm the natural ecosystems around beach. 
the shelter, larval hosting, forage, ecological communities, and soil quality, beech foster may all be devastated. And as we discussed, beech nuts are a critical food source for many air animals. This loss will put significant stress on wildlife populations like black bear, porcupine, rodents, and many songbirds. Plus, these animals are even more dependent on beech nuts now than they ever were before as historic food sources of the forest have been declining. We've already lost chestnuts in the forest, and now we're losing red, black, and pin oaks um, and their acorns due to mortality from bacterial leaf scorch. Even more unforeseen impacts may occur, and only time will reveal them. Is the sun setting on beach and beach forests in New Jersey? Let's hope not, but we need to be prepared for it. I just want to show you a couple photos that document how rapidly the disease is progressing. Here is pictured a forest in Morristown National Historical Park in 2021. You can't see it, but just a few leaves and every other tree were infected and an estimated less than 1% 1 infected leaves um, existed here in this beech forest. This is the same scenario, similar forest in Morristown National Historical Park, very few infected leaves. And one year later, this is in 2022. Wow, <laughs> just saying this to you all just gave me chills. This is a sad sight. There are more than 50% infected leaves in this forest and the understory was badly damaged and is defoliating. This is a very rapid disease progression. The forest floor is now going to be seeing a lot more sunlight. And here's a panoramic that shows uh, the, the loss of leaves in the sapling layer. This used to be a very dense sapling layer. And in this area, it, it's basically 50% or more infected. And regardless, as BLD advances to defoliation stages, there will be more light reaching the ground, canopy gaps created, and this allows invasive plants to move in. Unfortunately, canopy gaps in New Jersey forests are no longer poised to regenerate native forest trees. Overabundant deer in their severe browse of tree seedlings coupled with invasion of exotic plants prevents forests from naturally regrowing in canopy gaps as they once did. Now, serious human intervention is required in order to proactively plant and regrow forests. Without intervention, invasive plants will infiltrate and dominate these beach areas. And one note, the forests that I've seen with beech leaf disease were infected first in the lower canopy. However, there are reports in other parts of the state and in other parts of um, the East where the upper canopy was infected first. This is due to the specific vector that brought it there, where they landed and where they ate the buds. So at this time, no, the infection trends are not really predictable. So we're really documenting year to year what we see and the variety in what we see. So here's some photo examples of canopy gaps in New Jersey. This could be the fate if we don't manage the canopy gaps that beech will create. These are dominated by the common invasive shrubs and they're void of native tree seedlings and saplings. What do we have here? Burning bush, multiflora rose, barberry, and wineberry. Here's another canopy gap with some newer invaders, Seibold viburnum and Photinia villosa. And as the invasion and canopy gaps continue, the ecosystem services of not only beach would be lost, but the value and benefits of the entire forest understory will be lost. And as we lose remaining canopy trees naturally or unnaturally over time, there will be no native trees to replace them. The unmanaged forest future 
looks like groves of this understory, full of invasive shrubs and vine leaves. So now we're left feeling a bit of doom and gloom. I'm sorry. This is pretty serious, but there are things that we can do to prevent this. But first, let's make sure you can spot BLD. Everybody take a look. Are we seeing the banding in the leaves? See, here's some on the left on the left side. It's really all over in this lower canopy and even on the right in this leaf litter. So if you see these signs in the winter, on the ground, in the leaf litter, or up in the canopy, you have BLD in your area and your beech trees are at risk. So now let's talk about what we can do. So for early infections, you can prune out the diseased leaves and branches. This will not work for heavily infected trees, only newly infected trees. And removing the leaves that are diseased are not going to prevent all new infections from vectors that nibble on the beech buds. But removing the infected leaves prevents potential arthropod or bird transmission from the infected leaves to nearby leaf buds. We still do not know if animals can really contract the nematode from the leaf and bring it back to the bud. Until we, it would be great when we do find this out, but until we do, we have to act as if that occurs. So in general, removing diseased parts of a plant is good practice to reduce infection potential. And remember, until we learn about transmission and how long the nematodes live in leaves, disposing of any infected leaves and buds in is best to be done in trash bags to remove them from the ecosystem. Do not compost them until we find out that it's safe to. The next step involves multiple ways that you can help to protect your beech trees by reducing stressors. This includes avoiding construction or tree work near beech trees to prevent soil compaction. And along the same lines, don't mow lawns near and under beach so to reduce soil compaction and root damage. When soil is compacted, it loses its air pore spaces. And then these pores, when it rains, would fill with water, but not if it's compacted. So then you lose the water holding capacity for plant uptake. It's a stressful situation for trees. If you have grass growing underneath your beach, like this European one in an urban environment, or any other tree for that matter, it is really best to remove the long grass, water heavily and replace with native ground covers or native leaf litter, or a thin layer of natural mulch. This is general good practice to reduce competition and stress to the root system of a tree. And remember, no lawn grass should ever be planted within the drip line of a tree. And drip lines can be big. This en entire photo basically that has grass really is the drip line of this tree. And if it were removed and were replaced with a native ground cover or a natural leaf litter or mulch, this tree would not have the stress of someone mowing over it once a week. And remember, don't do any of these things to any tree, but especially your beech trees. We really don't want to have volcano mulching still, and we, I see it all over the place. We don't want to cover up the natural root flares. We don't want to pile rocks around the base or their root flares of trees. That impedes its growth and can girdle the trees. And stop accidental girdling by leaving lines and ties around the stems. These are all very stressful for trees and it, they all are poor practice. So back to our list. Water your trees during times of drought and heat waves. It is important to water deeply once or twice per week 
not more frequently with less water. And if you can, remove invasive plants that are imposing harm to beach or are near beach. Invasive plants each have their own compet competitive mechanisms that can harm native trees and plants. Examples include allelopathy from the tree of heaven, also known Ilanthus, and barberry, which increases soil pH over time, or the water hogging and excessive shade that Norway maples impose. And in forests, it will be important to remove or manage invasive plant populations near beach. And you can see here, once this beach grove across the stream gets hit with BLD, this nearby established barberry will reproduce and easily spread into this new canopy gap. One more important way to protect beach is to call your trusted licensed tree expert for help. They can offer you a service that improves the health of your beech trees by fighting other health problems like beech bark disease or bleeding canker, which are fungal issues. And in fact, a common pho uh, phosphite fungicide treatment has been shown to improve the health of beech suffering with BLD. Even though phosphite treatments are fungicide treatments, they are not nematicidal uh, uh, treatments, but they help to fight the fungus that the beach have, so the beach don't have to, and they get to focus more energy on fighting the impacts of BLD. So even though there's no real treatment for the nematode, this step is what people are doing now and waiting until we come up with further treatments that may be more effective to kill the nematode. But doing this may be the best hope for beech trees on your property or some parks. However, it's really not practical to do for hundreds of trees in a forest. So what do we do in the forest? But we can also do more in our suburbs and urban areas is plant. This is the most critical step towards landscape and forest mitigation. It's planting trees. And of course, I've been pounding this into your head and I'm gonna say it one more time. The canopy gaps that will be created by beach losses create added light. It's an opportunity for invasive plants to easily and quickly dominate. But instead we need to manage these gaps, whether or not they're in a forest or in a suburb, we need to remove the invasives and plant for forest cohort trees under beach. Native forests, again, are not successfully regenerating in forest gaps or in traditional suburban yards. So we must plant forest trees there to ensure we have a forest canopy in the future. This is called artificial regeneration. And importantly, we must stick to the forest tree species that belong alongside beach and forests. We can't just plant whatever we want and expect to save our native biodiversity that way. The, the species that belong with the beach are what we're calling cohort species. It is especially critical to include white oaks and hickories to ensure that we maintain a thick leaf litter layer in the forest or underneath your urban beaches. I have a full list of cohort species coming up on the next slide. So just to continue through, it is best to plant local pyrogeny grown from local seed. County level pyrogeny really should be the goal, but we're not there yet. So NJ pyrogeny will do. Also smaller size stock is preferred in sizes less than seven gallons is best. It's not only cheaper and easier to transport and easier to plant, but smaller planted trees are, as opposed to larger B and B stock, suffer less transplant shock, grow faster, grow healthier, and have a greater chance of survival. Oop, I just lost my place. Okay, and so the goal for planting 
is not just one tree for one beach lost. We really need to be planting stands. So what I think is we should be planting like three foot spacing underneath a whole drip line of beach. This could mean 10 trees, 15 trees, 30 trees. But what I really mean are saplings. So we go small and we plant them tightly together. This is natural, this strategy. This is how healthy forests naturally regrow and we need to replicate it. And no matter what size tree is planted, they must be protected from deer damage, both browse and buck rub. These photos here on the right show why you're fencing around young trees. There are many options that you can use for deer protection or deer barriers. However, the best options do not require constant repair and they allow for air circulation. And I would just like to mention, this direly needed mass reforestation effort is a fantastic opportunity for local New Jersey nurseries to collect seed, grow local porogeny, sell small stock trees, as well as provide deer barrier supplies. We need the ornamental horticulture growers to provide these supplies for land stewardship in New Jersey. And we need contractors to provide these stewardship services. This is the path forward to mitigate BLD as well as other deadly forest and tree diseases. We must use all the green industry has to offer to provide supplies for all contractors and consumers to steward our land, which should be forested, in an environmentally sustainable way. So here's our species list I promised you of beech tree cohorts in New Jersey. On the left, I have listed our wetter soil species, our bottomlands and mountain seeps. And on the right, here's a list of rocky soil species, uplands and for slopes. And Notice how I did omit the red oak group from this list. Until we have a better handle on bacterial leaf scorch, I would advise to focus on planting white oak group species instead, like the swamp white oak, uh, white oak and chestnut oak. And also notice there's some species that a lot of people plant that aren't on this list, and it's because they do not belong growing in beech forests. This includes some ecologically rare plants that have been overplanted in the developed landscape, like redbud and pawpaw, and trees that are actually invasive in New Jersey, even though they're native elsewhere, like black locust and honey locust. The omitted species, they're not cohorts of this forest type, and they also are not the best choices to support local New Jersey habitats. They are not the best choices to conserve natural plant community assemblages, and they are not poised to naturally migrate into these forests where beech live, as they, however, are poised to invade these areas, alter the soil type or growing conditions, and make it more conducive for their own species as well as invasive species. But I'll put this topic to rest. This is for a whole other lecture in the future. So I hope you took a screenshot of this list. And for more tree species and forest type information, please see Colin and Anderson's book, Plant Communities of New Jersey. So there is hope for New Jersey forests, even though, oh, I don't know if you're, I got a poll. I'm gonna put, so Yes, I, I started the poll, but go ahead and finish up. <laughs> no, I, I didn't know if it was showing my poll to everyone. Um, so I click, I just closed it. Out, so what's our job? Even though we may have fewer beaches, we can't have fewer trees. We need to not lose shade and we can't lose all ecological function. We may lose a lot of the beach specific ecological functions, but we need to support what we have with the species we can use. So whether it's a forest in rural New Jersey, in the suburbs or in the cities, in urban forest, we can all do our part to reforest sustainably and mitigate the impacts of BLD. Any questions? Okay, Jean. 
Um, thank you. Folks, it sounds I, like you have a lot. Yeah. Um, <laughs> well, first of all, I did launch the, the poll. So if you could please go ahead while, while Jean is answering questions, if you could please go ahead and start answering those, those poll questions, I would appreciate it. As I mentioned at the beginning of the presentation, um, before I get to the questions, I want to make sure that you know um, tonight's program is obviously free uh, to the public, but you can donate to our program if you'd like uh, through the Rutgers Environmental Stewards Program. If you go onto the Rutgers Environmental Stewards website, we do have a place for you to donate, and that supports this type of programming. It supports um, our extension volunteer projects, uh, supplies, staff, things like that. So that you can, I will, we'll put that website in the in the chat. All right, questions. Jean, um, couple here. First of all, have, from Eric, has anyone begun to study the cumulative impact of beech bark disease combined with beech leaf disease, and what are they finding? There have been some studies, and the basic findings are increased stress, but they are out there on Google Scholar if you you know, for details, but yes, they combined, they're, they're very impactful together. And fortunately for New Jersey, which is kind of amazing to say, because I feel like in New Jersey, we really have all the problems. Beach park disease is not that severe. It's more se uh, severely impacting the beach further up north. So they have been studying in the Great Lakes region, um, both diseases together. Okay. Okay. Uh, another question from Trish, uh, do the nematodes pass through the bird vector or live on the bird vectors? So we don't know everything, but I think they found them in the bird's mouth and in their gut. Okay. So we don't know if, like, if a bird, you know, um, transports it by its droppings, but we do know that the infection court is the bud. So it's most likely that it's from biting the bud and, and eating the bud and having the nematode in their mouth. Okay. All right. Um, so another question from Eric notes that um, he's pretty sure that BLD arrived in Rockport, Massachusetts only in 2022. At first, I thought it was just one patch, but the more I looked, the more we found it all over the beach forest in our town. Is the thought that birds transported it so to so many locations in a single year? I I can I I I understand this this sentiment. I spend a lot of time in Connecticut, and I was just astonished at how quickly it was it it was there. Yeah, it's I we like. So studies are ongoing. I can't say anything definitively, but all that we do know is that we are suspecting birds to be the long distance vectors. They could also be short distance vectors and potentially arthropods are like very short distance vectors, meaning within a stand or within a tree. Okay. Okay. So that's all that we know, but I guess the birds eat a lot. Maybe, you know, certain flocks are more infected than others. And that's why we're getting such a, um, the pattern that we're seeing in the landscape of infection. Oh, wow. Okay. Um, okay. More questions coming in from Barbara. Is the white oak susceptible to leaf scorch? So a lot of species are, are susceptible to bacterial leaf scorch and white oak is included, beech is included, some, you know, other species. However, the most highly susceptible are the red oak groups. Um, uh, oaks. So, you know, black, pin, scarlet, and red. So that's why I really just avoid that in planting. You can still plant those species successfully, but you really need to make sure you're planting in a native soil or a soil that's reconstructed to be native. And that's more, that's more for like, a, I, I could explain further, probably not right now, but Trees in general that are stressed are more susceptible to disease. So the, so the more degraded a soil is, the more you're exposing it to stress. And so when it's stressed, it gets bacterial leaf scorch, for instance, oaks. Okay, okay. Um, okay, should we sanitize our hiking boots after hiking in an area with Bill at BLD? Is that That's a really good question, and I was worried about that even walking around these woods doing right. surveying, and I was switching out my boots. 
So no one has concretely said anything. Um, I did hear and I did speak um, with Rich Buckley just to double check any new findings. And supposedly once the leaf is dry, the, the nematodes have nothing to eat, so they die off, supposedly. So that's an assumption. So maybe in, you know, there's a short period of time between the, the leaf, you know, dying and falling off the tree, especially, you know, with marquescence. Mm -hmm. so there might be a period of time where there are live um, nematodes in the leaf litter, but it's probably very short. Right, right. What would they eat unless... Yeah, the and soil? then... That has to get to the, whatever you got on your feet has to get to the bud. So think about right. how that would happen. Arthropods, maybe it could probably, it could happen maybe, but I think it'd be rare. Okay. Okay. All right. But I'm just assuming we don't know. <laughs> right. Right. God, there's so much unknown. Yeah. Uh, okay. Um, so lots of comments. Ama the term amazing is being used a lot. <laughs> Gene. Amazing, like how for bad your, this for is? your presentation. Oh, well, <laughs> the word amazing a lot. Um, question from Sarah Do you think beech hang on to their leaves for extra photosynthesis during the winter months? Probably not because they're dry, right? Right, right. So, there's a, there's a lot of um curiosity about Marquesans. But no one really knows why it happened. I have some really nerdy theories, but <laughs> you can email me and we can talk about that. <laughs> okay. Um, okay. Uh, what is the mortality in forests where BLD has been present? Uh, the, for They want to know five to 10 years, but, but I guess I'll, I'll add to that. Yeah, so we... Yeah. The, the forests that I've been monitoring on going back for the next few years, we haven't seen any death yet, but that's because we only noticed it in um, 2021. So where it first, where I first found it and where it was first heavily infected, I'm going to go back and check, but we haven't um, really witnessed mortality in New Jersey. I, they have witnessed mortality further west where the infection um, first began in 2012. And so they, we know the mortality timing because of that information that they've collected over time. Okay. Okay. Um, should beech tree tapping for sap be voluntarily stopped? It's an interesting question. Uh -oh. I mean, I guess like, unfortunately, there's no regulation. So I think ethically, if I were a, a beach, like, you know, stand owner tapping my trees, I would probably stop unless, I don't know, you're really wanting to get as much sap as you can before you can't anymore. Right. It's, it's actually news to important, me. you know, your beach or your sap. W while we're talking about this, because this is news to me that you can pat you can tap beech trees. What are we talking about here? Compared to the sugar maple or the red maple, what, what are we talking about with beech trees? You know, it's yep. probably like, the, I think you need, to tap, you need to get a lot more of the sap. Okay. To make. It's, it's not as sweet. Okay. It's like, you know, maybe similar to people also tap hickories. So it's right. maybe a similar, you know, dilution of sugars. Okay. You know, in the sap, so... All right. Um, yeah, Barbara would like to know, could you spray the buds with something that the birds don't like? Could you deter the birds? I've never heard that, but that's a good idea. The thing is, you know, you got to kind of have a small beach that you can reach all the buds. So it's there's only a certain amount of time that, you, you know, they right. grow and you can't reach them all. And that's what's hard about spraying anything. Like if you think about what we do to try to keep hemlocks alive, if you don't inject them and you spray them, you're drenching them with some sort of compound. And it might not be good for the, the, the surrounding area. So, but that hasn't been thought of yet as far as I know. Right. But, yeah. Like with Emerald Ash Borer, there, there is a systemic that's, act, that's very effective for, mm -hmm. for- And they've tried that. They, they've tried MMectin benzenate and, right. and it didn't work. 
um, it wasn't effective enough. Okay. Even at a higher, um, at a higher rate, that's beyond what they suggest for Novash borer. So it, it just didn't, I think it's because it didn't reach into the bud. So that's the thing about the injection is you have to pass through all the mass of the wood and all the branches to get all the way to the bud. Only the bud, whereas EAB is in the, is in the, the, the cambium. It's in the trunk. Yeah. We get to it. Oh, okay. I understand. And it gets to it faster. So they're thinking about, um, you know, like, I don't know if they're trying foliar sprays, but if you like, just in general, it's really tough. I know that there's a lot of progress and there is hope that maybe by the end of this year, there's, they're going to have something, but in general stuff that kills nematodes is pretty strong. And imagine spraying that all over a beach. Right. You're yeah. killing the whole ecosystem around a beach. We don't. Mm -hmm. So just think about it. Okay. <laughs> it okay. I, about what the potentially what it could be I really don't know and I can't say okay um another question from Trish do we know what the natural control is for this nematode in its native habitat um I think that researchers are starting to look at that but uh um it could be diseases it could be fungi it could be mites it could like very small you know things that attack or, or or disease the nematode but it's not it's probably not any sort of larger animal i don't suspect um so they the researchers are looking into it they're also looking into uh, is some sort of a fungus that they carry making the beech leaf disease worse for beech so that's something that researchers are looking at and wondering why this fungicide really helps to um, improve the health of the beach. So there's a, so much unknown and they are, they are looking into it, of course. Okay. Um, who, who is they? Who, who are the main researchers on this? Where, where is the hotbed? of? Um, I think that the hotbed started where the, the infection um, began. So okay you know, in like the Cleveland, Ohio area. And then, um, and then some research is done in Western New York, really close proximity. And then I think, you know, now it, it, researchers all over, like maybe even in Asia are looking into um, work, you know, working with from people from researchers from this country with people on the other side of the world to determine um, controls there and, you know, what naturally kills the nematodes there and what keeps their populations in check. But again, what's, what's difficult is that it's still have to figure out where this subspecies, how that originated, because they don't exactly know yet. Mm -hmm. they, the main species is from, a, uh, lives on Japanese beach, but they, they're, this is different. This new subspecies, Mechania, is differentiated because of some morphological differences. Mm -hmm. So we don't even understand exactly how that arose yet. Okay. Okay. Well, this last question here, and I, I think you may have touched on this already, is um, any idea what the mortal mortality rate is out west? Um, how bad is this? I think we you discussed this a little bit already. Yeah, so like west meaning west in the range of infection, it's that's where we know the mortality rate. And that's why we know it because in about six to ten years, um, an infected mature beach can die, and this is without treatment. This is without the phosphide or any other measures. Um, and then saplings could be about two years because they're just so much smaller and have fewer leaves. Uh, so in general, like there are no beach out further West, so we don't at least right. any risk to those forests. Okay. Okay. All right. Well, that's all the, the questions, please folks, if you haven't already finished up the poll, just, I'm going to close it in, a, in about a minute, if you could do that. Thank you so much, Jean, for being with us this, this evening, uh, Folks, we have lots of sessions this spring. Next week is uh, microplast microplastics with Dr. Judith Weiss, tiny particles with major impacts. She's going to uh, discuss all aspects of microplastics, how diverse they are, where they come from, 
how they are distributed in the environment, what effects they have, and what can be done about them, especially what you, you specifically can do about them. So please um, join us next week and join us for, for all our other sessions this spring. This has been recorded. It will be online on the Earth Day every day. Uh, websites, as are all the, the recordings from all of our sessions from the last three, three years. You can access them all there. All right, everybody have a great evening. Bye, everyone. Thank you.